sense that there may, there may be some people here who, who don't know even, even who I am. Is there anyone here that just happens to be visiting for the very first time that you don't, you don't even really know a whole lot about our church? Is anyone like that? Okay, very good. Very good. Amen. So my, my name is, I'm Pastor David Burzens. This church plant is started as another church uh, that, we, that, that is being spawned off of our local church in Georgia. So I pastor a church in Norcross, Georgia. It's called Stronghold Baptist Church. And there are, we knew there's a lot of um, people here already that wanted to be a part of what we're doing in the ministry that we're already doing in Georgia. There's a lot of people who are like-minded in their beliefs and what the church is really about. And this is why we decided to start a church here in Greenville. We know that there's uh, a lot of people in this area that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, pretty much everywhere in the world needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? But there's, there's a humble spirit here, and I think there's a lot of people as a result of all the efforts we've already put in this weekend uh, that, that, that are uh, soft to, to hearing. They're receptive to hearing the gospel. They want to know how to be saved, and we are going to try to fill that need. And I want to just kind of give you a... Um, what the spirit of Stronghold Baptist Church is. So whether you're new, whether you're not new, you've been around for a long time, this is going to be a guiding principle, a guiding spirit for this church going forward and what the main objective is. And again, if you're new here especially, we go through a lot of scripture. We, we really exalt the Bible, the word of God as being our guide. And this is what we should always be looking to to guide us in, in what we ought to be doing with everything in our life, and especially in church. Now, also just to explain the authority structure real briefly, uh, the man who's going to be here week after week on a regular basis, his name is John Carter. We just ordained him. I just ordained him last week as the evangelist for this area. He's responsible for running things. He's going to be responsible for preaching. He's responsible for all the soul winning that's going to be going on out here. And uh, basically all the administration that happens, but the, the authority still rests as, with me as a pastor over both of the, ch the churches. But I really just want to make sure it's clear that I don't want to have, you know, there ought not to be many issues. There should be no issues. And I just want to emphasize that, you know, I've found, you know, and, and many of you already know Brother Carter, but I have full confidence in his ability to lead and his ability to run things here. And I really want everyone here at the church plant to be looking to Brother Carter, to Evangelist Carter, as the person who is running things and in charge and, and, and taking care of everything. Obviously, if there's something, just some real weird thing go on or something, let me know. But I will be here, as I mentioned before, as frequently as I can, just see how things are going and make sure things are going really well. But I have full confidence, full trust. Brother Carter's going to do an awesome job here. He's a great leader. He's a great man of God. He's a great family man. So uh, definitely someone that is going to be taking the direction for this church, okay? And, and, and I really emphasize just please look to him and, and follow his guidance, too. I don't want to hear people go, well, Brother Carter said to do this. Do you want, you know, like, look, man, he's in charge. And that's what I'm going to tell you. You know, go to him uh, directly, and he will be able to uh, run things here very smoothly. Um, and then before I get into the scripture, you know, just I, I want you all to understand this is your church. It's not my church. It's not Evangelist Carter's church. I mean, it is a church. He's going to be here, but it's your church. OK, it's not just any one person's church. You are the church. The, the extent to which this church can do great things is going to be the extent to which every single person is willing to put in effort, to put in work, to 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 really um, Put what you have into this and also how much you're willing to yield yourself to the will of the Lord. Right. Christ is the head of this church. It's Christ's church. And hopefully you will be edified. Hopefully you will grow. Hopefully you will learn if you continue to come to this church and, and get into the word of God and find the areas in life where you need to make improvements. But but continue to serve God. And we started in Philippians chapter two. And for those of you that know me, know this is one of my absolute favorite chapters in the entire Bible because this encapsulates, in my mind, what it means to be a Christian. This tells us how to have that Christ-like mind or the Christ-like spirit. And we're going to reread part of this, starting in verse number 1. In Philippians chapter 2, the Bible reads, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ... 
if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. And, and the, the goal here is to get everyone in the church, this is written to the church uh, uh, in, in Philippi, to the Philippians, and look, we all ought to have, be in one accord, have one mind here, be striving together, working together um, to have the same goal. Look at verse number three and how we're going to get there. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. So first of all, as we work together, it's a team, right? We're, we're not in competition against one another. We're not fighting against one another. We're not trying to get vain glory and see, oh, how much I could do better than you. Or, but, you know, no, we're here to help and support one another, not to, like, outshine one person or another. It's not about you. It's not about your vain glory. And this is a mindset that we all ought to have. Um, in lowliness, and look at this, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And this mindset, this spirit is critical. It's critical in all that we do in our Christian lives, which should be our lives, right? If you're, if you're a believer, you're a Christian, your Christian life should be no different than your life. You, you don't put on the Christian life when you walk through the doors of church and you show up and everyone can see you in your Sunday best and, and you've got your Bible and you can say the right things and then you go home. But then your life is actually just not a Christian life. That's hypocrisy, right? God wants us living the Christian life every day of our life. And how are we going to do that? Well, it's going to start with lowliness of mind. Because as what does it mean to be a Christian? You're a follower of Christ. And what did Christ come here to do? He came not to be ministered to, the Bible says, but to minister. He came to serve others. He came, he, he, he preached, he healed, he taught, but ultimately he sacrificed. He sacrificed himself. And, and he sacrificed his time. He sacrificed his, his energy. He sacrificed everything. He went out for those three and a half years his ministry lasted and, and was preaching and teaching and reaching the lost and doing everything he could to help others and nothing for self-gain, self-benefit, anything like that to the point of dying on the cross for our sins, to the point of giving himself completely 100% for other people, yea, for the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life. That is the ultimate in self-sacrifice. That is the ultimate in humility and esteeming others better than yourself. See, when you think of people as, as other people being better than you, it's going to be a lot easier to serve, right? It's going to be a lot easier to help. Oh, wait, only one of us can have the last donut or whatever. Like, no, 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 you have it. Now, that's a real carnal example. I get it. But when you're thinking about just in general, oh, to help this person out, it might cost me whatever. Oh, they need help, but, but it's going to cost me gas. It's going to cost me time. It's going to, you know, whatever. But you're thinking, yeah, but you know what? I really need to help them because they're important. That's the mindset and serving people. So um, let's continue reading here. Philippians 2, verse. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So Yes, we ought to be independent and be able to kind of be self-sufficient as much as possible. But also you need to you need to be caring about other people, right? Thinking like, well, hey, how, you know, do, do they need help? Is there anything I can do to help them? Very similar to the preceding verse. Verse number five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And this is the Christian mind. This is everything we've just been reading. Hey, let this mind be in you. And we all ought to have this mind together. Oh, you fulfill my joy is that we could all be like-minded. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Fulfill my joy there in verse 2, that ye be like-minded having the same love. And you know what? That would make me super happy is to show up here and see a whole church full of people that are humble, that want to serve, that want to help, that are there for other people, that are there to minister. Because this is a ministry. We are here to serve. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant 
and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So I don't care who you are. I don't care what accolades you have. I don't care what status you have in society. You know, we all ought to be able to humble ourselves. If God himself can humble himself and take on the form of a human being, take on the form of his own creation and go through this life and suffer ridicule and suffer shame and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, I think no matter whoever the person is at the highest in standing or highest regard ought to be able to humble themselves to be able to serve others as well. Jump down to verse number 13. If I read for it is God, which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. What's murmuring? Complaining. Who is complaining? Oh, we're going to go out this. Oh, Pastor Burson is asking me to go out and it's hot outside. And, you know, like, you know what? Go out because you want to. Go out with a good attitude. Go out, whatever it is. Nobody likes complaining. Nobody likes complaining. I mean, that's, that should be self-evident, but, man, it becomes even more evident when you start having kids. And, like, you start hearing people like, oh, man. Talk about a dampener or a downer. You get, you know, everyone could be in a good mood, and then someone just starts complaining. It's just like, come on. In fact, you know, complaining is so bad, and this is, this is not my notes, but Moses, when you read about the children of Israel, and they murmured and complained, and, and, and this is a really good point, though, for murmuring, because when you really think about it, if you put yourself where the children of Israel were when they were led out of Egypt, remember at the crossing of the Red Sea and everything else, and they were going through the wilderness, they really didn't have much, okay? They had to eat the same food for every meal, just day after day after day after day after day after day. Now, we look at that and go, oh, cool, man, God provided manna. That's awesome. It's a miracle. They went out. So when you look at the positive side of things, it's just blessing. It's like, hey, praise the Lord for this. But it's real easy to become a murmurer and go, oh, man. They, they got so bad, they got to the point where they're like, I remember what it was like in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. Okay, they were in bondage. They were servants. They, they, were, they, were, you know, they had taskmasters over them. But because they had to eat the same food over and over and over and over and over again, they're going, oh, man, I remember, I remember what it was like to eat. We had cucumbers and melons and leeks and, you know, all the, all the garlic and everything else that they were saying. We had, we had all this great stuff back in Egypt. Well, look, God promises to take care of you. come necessarily in this life it's going to come in the afterlife it comes it comes at the judgment seat of christ when all of your works are laid before christ and then that which has value is going to remain and abide the fire but that's those are gifts those are rewards of eternal value and and that's one more reason to serve the lord besides it just being the right thing to do is that he promises to take care of us murmurings yeah they 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 kept complaining 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 to the point to where moses was like he goes to god going like i just want to die and he was serious like god just 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 end it now because the complaining was so bad and and that's what that does so we you know not um fall into doing things with murmurings and and what's disputing it's fighting right having disputes and fighting about stuff look let's let's you know, as this church, we need to be in unity. Uh, it's a brotherhood here. No murmurings, no complainings, no disputings. But look, everything's all voluntary. Do whatever. If you want to help, help. If you want to serve, serve. Great. And we love that. And that's what we're going to teach and, and push for everybody to let's, let's work together. Let's, let's have a common goal of reaching people with the gospel of Christ as the ultimate goal. But it's all on, on your willingness and what you want to do. So let's not get involved with complaining and disputings that you may be blameless and harmless as sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. 
among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And that's our job. Okay, this world is crooked and perverse. That hasn't changed. The world is going to continue to be crooked and perverse until Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom here on earth. Until then, we, we live in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. And honestly, things are just continuing to get more and more perverted by the day. It's just a fact. But you know what? We're supposed to be the light. And what do you do with the light? You let it shine. Right? Just like that, the little kid's song, right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hey, that's a good song. Right? It's, teaching, it's teaching kids. You know, adults could learn from that too. Let your light shine. Are you born again? Are you saved? Is Jesus your savior? Do you have that new creature inside of you? You got you to let that new man shine. You got to let that show and, and be apparent to other people, not just blend in with the crowd and just like, oh, here's everyone in the world. And mixed in with that, you just have a whole bunch of Christians and no one would ever know it because there's no light shining there. Let the light shine. Wait, you guys, you guys actually go out and you knock on doors? Isn't that kind of weird? What are people going to think? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't care. What's God going to think? And that's what you're asking. And, and you know, we're going to go through some more scripture today because the, the, the main focus and what I'm going to be focused on the most tonight this evening is reaching people with the gospel. And, and if you walk away with nothing else, I want you to see this. I want you to know that the scripture commands us. It is our job. It is our duty to be the ones to bring forth that good news to a lost world. Amen. We're in the midst of a crooked, perverse nation. We need to shine. We need to let the light shine. It's up to us. Okay. Christ had a ministry here on earth, but that was 2,000 years ago. He is no longer walking around on this earth. He's no longer communicating with people verbally, aud you know, audibly. He's entrusted his followers. He's entrusted believers with that task. And, and again, I'll prove that to you from Scripture, but keep that in mind. That is of the utmost importance because, hey, if our gospel's hid, it's hid to them that are lost. And at the end of the day, what's going to happen? You're saved. You're good, right? Hey, I have Jesus as my Savior, but what if you never tell anyone else about that? What's going to happen? Well, all the people you could have talked to, if no one else talks to them, what's going to happen? If no one else shares the gospel with them, what's going to happen to them? They're going to die and go to hell. But I think God will just give them another chance. No, he won't. No, he won't. The chances people have to get saved are while you're still breathing air in this life. When you're alive, here, this is your chance. There is no second chance. There is no duel. There is no, oh, well, he didn't quite get to hear a good presentation, so God will just preach the gospel to him after he's already dead. Not going to happen. If you think that's going to happen, show me in the Bible where this says that that's going to happen. It's wishful thinking, but it's false. It's a lie. It's a lie to get people to feel comfortable about not shining the light. It's a lie to make people comfortable with not sharing the gospel because it makes you uncomfortable, because it makes you a little uneasy. But I'm just not, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm introvert. I get it. I understand. Hey, look, I understand as much as anyone. And for those of you that don't know me, just a little bit of testimony to glorify God with, because God is able to make any change in a person's life, any change, if you are willing to let him. I am in IT and have been for over 20 years. If you know anything about IT people, we're a little bit of a different breed. Okay? Just so that most of you know that, right? So yeah, am I comfortable right now preaching in front of people? Yes, I am. But you know what? This hasn't always been the way I was. It has nothing to do with my skill or my ability because I have none. I am not a public speaker gifted to have charisma and everything else. Never had that. Never. In fact, the first time I ever spoke up at any event behind a mic, I literally got sick to my stomach and I had to just cut myself, stop talking and run away and, and buckle over in pain because it was painful to get in front of people. Not kidding. Who remembers the tea parties back in 08 maybe, 07, something like that? Yeah, long time, sorry, <laughs> I started aging myself. But I used to be a lot more political and I was at one of those events, and there was, you know, something happened, and I decided to get up and, and say something, which was, I was already debating, like, should I even do this? 
that's where I felt just physically ill trying to speak to anybody. And I remember the first time when I, when I went to start going to church, a good church that taught soul winning, going out like, hey, this is our duty, this is what we're supposed to do. I saw it from the scripture, said, okay, I know I need to do this. But I was deathly afraid of doing it, but I went anyways. And for probably years, and everyone is a little bit different on how long it takes to kind of get comfortable with for for a while, I was just like, I mean, I was at every door. It's like, don't enter the door. Don't enter the door. Don't enter the door. Okay. Why? My anxiety, my fear. Okay. Now, is, was the fear justified? Absolutely not. It was just my own, own internal fear, my own anxiety, things that I had to overcome. Irrational, didn't make any sense. Okay. But I get it. So if you're going to say anything, I could have compassion and I understand what it's like. Believe me, I do. To be uncomfortable trying to talk to someone, especially a stranger. Like, that person doesn't even know me. What, you know, what's going to happen? Like, I slam the door in my face. I get really angry. You know, whatever. What's going to happen? I don't know. This is where you have to have faith in the word of God. And you have to be willing to just say, okay, well, hey, look. This may be uncomfortable for me. I may not even understand this. I may not get this. But if, if the Bible says that this is something that we ought to be doing, if you could see it clearly as a command, then you know what? We ought to do it. We ought to do it. And, and hopefully you have the heart that says, I'm willing to do the things that might be uncomfortable. If, if, if that's what God would have me to do, then I'll do it. But God never promises you, as a Christian, to have an easy life here. Now, he's promised you an eternity to be with him an eternity ruling and reigning and all the blessings and everything that's going to go in eternity to no longer have these bodies and the aches and the pains and the sorrow and the tear and the grief. We won't have any of that. Hey, praise God for that. But here we are not promised the easy life. Jesus Christ himself said, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus didn't say that. It's in the Bible, though. All that will live godly. Will, will means you want to. And, and why would that be? Well, no one was more Christ-like than Jesus. And what happened to him? He was crucified. Now, now many people followed him and loved him and, 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 and were supportive. But even more people hated him and wanted him dead, which is what ultimately ended up happening. So just keep that in mind. Let's keep reading here in um, Philippians 2, verse number 15. They may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's go back in your Bible a few pages, back to 2 Corinthians and we're going to be in chapter 3. And there's a, there's a train of thought starting in chapter 3 to chapter 4 and to chapter 5 that I want to get through most of this, so I'm not going to spend too much time expounding as much as I did in Philippians 2. But I want you to see this because this, this, this whole goes forward. Starting in verse number 12, the Bible reads, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So he's explaining that back when Moses was... When he would go and commandments from God, he was talking to God like face to face. But then when he came down from the mountain, his face shone so brightly that he had to put a veil over his face because the people couldn't bear even to see the reflection of what God had for them because his face was reflecting the brightness of God. And so he had to put a veil over his face so that they could even communicate with him and not get freaked out by the brightness of what he had but 
now in the New Testament, it's, it's showing the symbolism that, hey, they still have a veil over their face. They're not understanding the things of God. They're not able to clearly see the truth there. He says, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. So Moses had the veil on his face, which was kind of blocking some of the glory of God and in, in, in the truth there. But the veil is on their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And this, this is indicative of what it's like for when people, before they're saved, before they put their trust in Jesus, there's a veil there. You don't quite understand what the Bible is talking about. You, you, you don't really have a good understanding of what's written. Because you don't have the spirit. Because you're not born again. You're not saved. The Bible is a spiritual book. The Bible says that the, the natural man receiveth not the things of God. The, the, the things of God are spiritually discerned. So we need to be born again in order to turn to Christ. Hey, that veil is taken away. Verse 17 says, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Freedom, right? Amen. Freedom from the curse of the law. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Let's look at chapter 4, verse number 1. Continuing on, therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. So look at that. We have this ministry. And what was it before? It's talking about receiving Christ, receiving the Lord, and having that veil removed. Now he says, hey, we have this ministry. We have received mercy. If you've received mercy from the Lord, you've received forgiveness of sins. Now we have this ministry that we faint not, so we don't quit, but have renounced talking and craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. And look, going forward, this is important for this church too, don't handle the word of God deceitfully, right? You want to show people stuff from the Bible, you better be showing them truth. And, and, and don't let people accuse you of cherry picking. Now look, I get it. When you're trying to show, there's a lot of things in the Bible and there's certain verses that you can't just go through everything, through all context and read all whole chapters when you're talking to people about stuff. But just make sure that if you're trying to prove some doctrine, you're trying to prove something you believe in from Scripture, you're not handling the Word of God deceitfully. Because there's plenty of people out there that will cherry pick these obscure passages that no one even knows and no one's heard of really, and unless you're really in your Bible they're trying to show you stuff and be like, oh, look, see here, you know, Jesus really isn't the son of God or whatever. That, like the, the Jehovah's false witnesses try to do is to, um, you know, be deceitful with the word of God. That's not how you ought to be. You don't handle the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves, every man's conscience in the sight of God. And I, I preached this this morning at Norcross, but, you know, the truth should fear no investigation also. So anything you believe, you ought to be able to just support it and, and let pe you know, have people ask questions and not s steer away from, from any investigation, any questions, and be able to just answer everything with the scripture and don't be deceitful with it. Right? If, you're, if you're not being deceitful, then there's nothing to fear, right? Keep going. No, you know, like Scientology, like you can't talk to anybody else. If anyone says anything against Scientology, you gotta you gotta cut them out of your life. But like Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, it's real similar. They don't want you to know all the prop the false prophecies of Joseph Smith and all this. You know, like oh yeah, don't don't be listening to those people. Don't don't even don't try to research that stuff. We try to cover it up. You know, we're not trying to cover up the truth. We're trying to to find the truth and share the truth. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves, every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse number three. But if our gospel be hid, as I, I quoted earlier, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. And let me never hear about someone going out and preaching himself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not preach ourselves. But what do we preach? But Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. This is the instruction. Hey, look, 
We're going to go out. We're not preaching ourselves, but we're preaching Christ Jesus the Lord. And I'll, you know, I'll even take the moment to say this. One of the ways that some people like to, um, to preach the gospel is to give their testimony. But I would shy away from that because your testimony doesn't really matter. What matters is the testimony of Jesus Christ and what he did. Amen. That's what matters when we preach the gospel. So maybe you got and, and you kinds of things in your life. And, you know, I brought up an example of myself with, with how God was able to work in my life and, and help me to overcome the fears and things like that. But when I'm trying to get people saved at the door, I'm not going to be talking about myself. You see what I mean? Like, like, however God was able to work in my life to allow me to be able to speak to people, if I'm trying to preach the gospel to someone, they don't need to hear about that. They need to hear about what Jesus did for them. They need to hear about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They need to hear about the free gift. They need to hear about being bought and paid for, and God loves you, and he wants you to be saved. And all you have to do is put your trust in him. That's it. Stop trusting in yourself. Stop trusting in your works. Stop trusting in how good of a person you are and put all of your faith in Jesus. He's the Savior. Let him save you. Amen. He wants to save you, but let him do it. Stop holding on to yourself and to your things and your actions and, and your goodness and whatever it is that you think, well, no, I need to have this too. No. Put it all on Jesus. Let him save you. He saves you. He gives you eternal life. Be humble enough to receive a gift, right? It's not by you at all. It's all by him. But that's what we need to teach. That's what we need to preach. Preach Jesus crucified. We don't preach ourselves. Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves. Hey, what, what are we? We're your servants. We're your servants for Christ. We go out to the lost as servants for Christ to bring the gospel to them. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's our body as an earthen vessel. Remember, God made Adam from the dust of the earth. We have these earthen vessels that the excellency of the power. So something so great. To bring forth life. To, sh to, to bring that light. He's given that to us that, that it, you know, it's, we're just these earthen vessels. He gets the glory. Because how could something like us, this earthen vessel, actually bring forth so much good? We can't. But God can. We are troubled on every side. Verse number eight. Yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest. In and, and notice, these aren't all very positive things. He's talking about, like, you know, the 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 dying of the Lord Jesus in our flesh, the, uh, you know, we're always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. But it's for the greater good. It's for, it's for that the life, hey, if the death is going to be shown in us, well, then, then it also is going to show forth the life of Jesus as well. Verse number 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. That's the self-sacrificial attitude, mindset. Right. Hey, I'm willing to go through all of these things for Christ's sake. But so that you could have life. And we see that attitude also in the mindset of the apostles, especially saying, you know, I, I, you know, I labor night and day. For you. To see you lifted up, to see you bettered. Saying uh, verse number 13, we have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. I love that. I believed, and therefore have I spoken. How many people believe, but then don't speak? I believed, and therefore I haven't spoken. Well, you know, Scripture's saying, look, I believe, and therefore I have spoken. 
We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Don't be worried about the physical exertion, whatever might happen outwardly to the flesh. Put forth that effort because the inward man, the saved man, the, the, the regenerated man is renewed day by day. And this is, you know, God will give you the strength to do what needs to be done. God's the one who's given the strength for all the soul winning efforts, even though it's hot, even though it's, you know, you're, you're getting exhausted. He's there to help you through uh, through those times, the, even though the outward man perished, the inward man is renewed day by day. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And this is what I was talking about earlier. Our light affliction, whatever we have to deal with here in like it's for a moment. Because our life, as the Bible says, is like a vapor. It appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. That's what our life is like here on this earth. So any affliction, what we, whatever we might have to deal with, any persecution you might have to deal with for the word of God, people making fun of you, or even maybe even getting because you believe the Bible. And it's not popular these days, so people want to cancel you, shut you down, you know, all that kind of stuff. That light affliction is but for a moment. But that light affliction worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. God's going to God will reward you for that. Any affliction that you're going through for his sake, for, for, for his cause, he will reward you in the end. While we look not at the things which are seen, we don't live for the see here, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen, what you see around you, this is all temporal. This is all here for a short time. Everything is going to burn up. The cars, the money, the chairs, the pulpit, you know, whatever. Like, so, so why get so hung up in having the fancy clothes and the fancy car and the, you know, and all? Temporary. All of it's temporary, and it's all going to be gone one day anyways. So who cares? Who cares about this stuff, really? Really care that much about it? Life is not about stuff. It's about people. It's about God. That's really what life, I mean, you really boil it down. All the stuff in the world you ever wanted, is that really going to do anything for you? I mean, really. You're gonna, you know what you're going to find? Emptiness. Everything you ever wanted physically in this earth, and you just snap your fingers, you just had it all. You'd, you'd find yourself going like, wait, there's nothing else to get? You get it gets old real fast. Just like any new thing that you get that you, you might have had your eyes on for a while, like, oh, man, I really, I really want to get an iPhone. I really want then you get it, it's just kind of like, how long does it take before it's just a regular phone? Oh, this piece of junk. You're throwing it around. Like at first, it's like, oh, you know, get, the, get the nice case. And, things. and, and then and it's like two weeks later, you're, pfft, stupid thing. <laughs> and that's how it is. With, it doesn't matter what it is, right? Like your cars, whatever, any of that stuff. Life's not about those. Don't worry about the things that you can see that are seen. Those are the eternal things. Right, we walk by faith and not by sight. Yeah. Chapter 5, verse number 1, the Bible says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a house of hands eternal in the heavens. So when our body dissolves, by, by faith, we know that we have, with God, we have, we, have, we have a house in heaven. We have a home. So right now, this body is our house. This is our home, right? We, we abide here in the flesh. But when this flesh is gone, we've got a new home. 
a new building, a new, a new place, a new tabernacle, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Verse 2, for in this we groan and earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we should not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we be unclothed, excuse me, but clothed upon that more swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, I just want to point out real quickly here, one of the, you know, especially if you're not new to this church, or if you are new to this church, you know, when we talk to people, I just had someone yesterday, you know, I asked him a question, hey, you know, if you die today, if you die tomorrow, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? Like, do you know that? He said, well, I'm not 100% sure. Like, no one could be 100% sure. Well, why do we ask that question? Because the Bible says that we could be confident. Amen. I mean, what's confidence if you're not 100% sure? I mean, that's the most confidence you get. Hey, we're confident. We're confident that God's real. We're confident that Jesus Christ paid for our sins when he died on the cross. We're confident of all these things. Well, isn't that kind of proud of you to think that you just know for sure? No, it's not. You know why? Because it's not based on how good I am. Right. If it was based on how good I was, then, yeah, it would be kind of arrogant to say, well, I know I'm making it to heaven. It's only arrogant to people who think that your works are going to buy you into heaven. But when you know that my works aren't good enough, that your works aren't good enough, but that the price that Jesus paid is good enough. Hey, that's all there is. The Bible said it. Jesus said it. Whosoever believeth. Amen. Once you do that, you can be confident. And the Bible says, hey, we are always confident. And we know that. Here in this body, we're absent from the Lord. We're not, obviously, we're not in heaven with God. We're still here. We're alive in this world. But hey, I'd just as well lose, die physically, because you know what that means? I'm going to be with the Lord. Now, does that mean I have some death wish? No, of course not. And, and you know, we'll keep reading, but I know that whatever day, you know, and this is why you don't have to be too sad. If I were to drop dead right now, it wouldn't be bad for me. It'd be good if you drop dead. If you're born again, let me, let me make sure we caveat this. If you're born again and you drop dead today, like right now, be great. I mean, you're, you're with the Lord, right? It's not a bad thing, which just we don't say these things so that we could have to die. We say these things because no matter what happens in this life, this, it, it's not, you know, we don't just live for this life. Right? So, so whatever we do, it's kind of like, well, okay, I mean, what are you going to do? Kill me? And, and look, you hear the stories of people who want others to renounce their faith, right? The horrible tragedies, and you got these shooters and stuff that want to go and, like, tell people, like, well, you better renounce Jesus right now or else I'm going to shoot you or whatever. Well, you know, if we got the mindset of, what are you going to do, send me to God? Okay. And again, it's not a death wish, but if, if we're right thing and god sees what happens and, and you know ultimately that's the reason why there exists because that does have an impact on other people that if you stay faithful to the end even under threat that carries weight of the testimony of christ you know the for example this is one of the reasons why the bible even has credibility you look at how bad the persecution was against Christians, against the believers, back from the times of Christ, the apostles, what they went through, the torture, the deaths, the martyrs that, that they, that, but maintained Jesus is the son of God. They didn't recant. They didn't change their testimony. And, and that's important. And many of them faced really serious consequences for the faith. But it's important to carry the weight of that going forward to just say, hey, look, do whatever you're going to do to me. You're never going to change my faith in Christ. That's just not going to happen. 
I'm not going to fear what man can do unto me, as the Bible says. You know, you, you, you think with it, you know, you decide for yourself what man can do for us versus um, what God could do for us. But let's keep reading here. Number, verse number eight, thank you. We're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive. Care of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion of glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. I don't want to spend too much time on the judgment of Christ here, uh, just for just for sake of time. Let's continue. It is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. I mean, we have it right there in black and white. So how is a believer supposed to live? For yourself? Or for the one who died and rose again for you. It's in. Do you believe the scripture? I do. Do you want to make that real for yourself? And look, you, you might be thinking like, man, you guys are nuts. You're religious zealots. You're crazy. But like, no, I just say we actually believe what the Bible says here. Amen. And not just everywhere. Open up the, you, you want to challenge me? Bring, bring a Bible up here and say, well, do you, but do you believe this? You know what the answer's going to be? Yes. But, do, but wait a minute. Wait, hold on a second, though. What about this? Yes. But what about this? Yes. But what about this? Yes. But what about this? Yes. Believe it all. Whether it's popular or not, you believe the whole. And you know what? When the Bible says, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth, so from this point forward, should not live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. I say amen. We ought to not live for ourselves and get distracted with all the cares and the things of this world. We ought to live for the one that died for you. The one that loved you enough when he deserved none of the shame, none of the guilt, none of the, the condemnation but decided to pay for your sins and to give you a free gift of eternal life, hey, you know what? We all ought to live for him. Verse 16, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Look at this. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He's going to explain what that ministry is. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. So when Christ was in the world, what was Christ doing? He was reconciling the world unto himself. God was working in Christ. To reconcile the world. What, and, and what is needed anyways? Well, sin. Because we have a God when we start breaking his laws. You're a criminal. You're guilty, right? You deserve a punishment. So our transgressions against the Lord puts us odds with God. It, there, there's a problem there that needs to be fixed. We need to have reconciliation. We need to be reconciled with God. Someone needs to make it right. Someone needs to set the account back at zero. Because right now we owe, right? As, as, as a sinner, as someone who doesn't have Christ, you owe. You have a big debt on your shoulders. You're going to reconcile me. Well, you know what? Jesus you. And when Jesus was in the world, he was reconciling people to God. 
he was going around, he was preaching the gospel, and he was reconciling. To what that God was in Christ, reconciled the world on himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. What does that mean? Giving them forgiveness. And hath committed, and look at this, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So now that job, because Christ has already been crucified, he's already rose again, he's already ascended into heaven, he's not doing that job anymore. Now it doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't save, of course Jesus saves, but but he's not, you know, people don't, you know, if they do, you know, they, they probably have some problems, but no one is having this experience of just walking and just having this, oh, I just talked with Jesus, and he told me that I was a sinner and I need to be saved, of like, like actually having some conversation with Christ. That's not happening today. The, the miraculous vision of the apostles is not something that's happening day to day. It's not something that's happening on a regular basis. It just simply isn't. And this job of reconciliation is given unto us. Verse 20 says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, since Jesus Christ isn't physically standing here, be ye reconciled to God. This is the spirit. This is the heart. What's the spirit? Right? Esteeming others better than yourself. Being willing to serve God. Saying, you know what? I'm not worried about the temporal things. I'm going to live for Christ. You have to give up everything that you have all of a sudden needs to be like full-time, uh, um, you know, preachers or whatever. You don't have to do that to be living a godly life, to be having, you know, living for the Lord, but you, ha- you have to be putting forth efforts to, to do this, right? You could still provide for your family. You could still go to work. You could still do the things that you need to do in this life to survive, Right? But the difference is, what are you really living for? Are you living just for fun, for vacations, for, you know, pleasure, for going out to the bar, for whatever people live for and just kind of spend all their time doing? What is it? What is it for? Or are you going to say, hey, I'm going to actually live for Christ, who gave himself for me, and I'm going to take the job of ambassador seriously as an ambassador, what are you doing? You're representing Christ. And, and whether you like it or not, every person who is saved, who has been saved by Jesus Christ, is an ambassador now for Christ. There is no special group of people here that are, that are being assigned. He says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. All of you in Corinthians, we, he's, he's putting himself in the same group of all the people in the the. Hey, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's said, Be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We have the duty. We have the responsibility. It's our job. And it's every believer's job. And at this church, that is the main thrust. This is the focus is going forth and trying to reach people with the gospel of Christ and get people reconciled to God. Because you know what matters more than just what happens here on this earth? Eternity. What good is it to help meet somebody's physical needs? Right? Let's say someone's in need. Let's say there's a poor person. They're struggling to eat. They're struggling to, to keep a roof over their head. They're struggling in all these areas. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing to help people struggle. I'm just saying, what good is it if you help in all these areas to meet all these temporal, physical, carnal needs right now, but then that person dies and goes to hell for eternity? Like, just to put it in perspective. Again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to, to, to help people out that way. I'm not, not at all. But what good is it, ultimately, if they just end up going to hell for all of eternity? So what, what matters the most, what's the most important is trying to spend eternity in heaven with the Lord not and, and, and completely avoid hell eternally. And that's a free gift, and that's available, and people just need to understand that. 
and a lot of people will believe that if someone just explains it to them. That's all it takes. They're ready. But you know what? God has given that duty on us to go forward, share the word, be the light, shine the gospel, and let people hear it. Can't make people believe, but you know what? We at least need to give them opportunity. And what we do here at this church is we give them the best opportunity possible. Okay, it's not a one, two, three, repay, pray after me. It's make sure people understand the gospel. Spend the time necessary, however much time that is. Make sure you understand the consequence of sin. We're all sinners. Make sure you understand that God loves them and Jesus paid for that sin, for the debt, for the punishment, for the punishment of hell. That's the, the wage for all of our sins. Make sure you understand that free gift. Make sure you understand also that once you receive that free gift, it is eternal life. It's not a lie. It's not, it's not, it's not thing of calling something eternal life, but it's not really eternal, right? God, God's not just trying to, to sell this package and be like, oh, hey, look, this is eternal life. You like commit this sin or that sin, but then, then it's not really eternal. I'm taking it back. No, it is eternal. It's forever. There's a new creature that's born again, as we were just reading Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. New man, new creature. Once that's there, you can't be unborn. Once you're born again, you're not unborn. You're, in, you're, you're a child of God. You're a child of God forever. Praise the Lord for that. Explain that. We've got to make sure people understand what the gospel is. Hear that. Put their trust in Christ. Amen. Please take to heart the spirit of humility, the spirit of Philippians chapter 2. And let this guide you and all you and you know what? Let it guide you on soul winning too. Okay, it, you know what we do is known as confrontational soul winning, because we can. But it's not arrogant soul winning. It's not I'm going to tell you how wrong you are and how right I am soul winning. It's humbly going forth, bearing the precious seed, and caring about the people that you're about to try to witness to and give the not having an air of arrogance you because you just know everything, but you know, no one's going to be very receptive to hearing that message. So take that to heart too, you know, that we could instruct those that oppose themselves that God might grant them repentance, right? It, it, it's very important bring cross to people. We don't shy away from it. We're not going to hide anything. We're not going to lie about it, right? We're going to tell the truth. We're not just going to be polite if someone's just, you know, spouting so you let them know. You know, sometimes people just need to be warned, hey, look, that's not true, but you could still do so tactfully. You could still do so lovingly and let people know, even if they're wrong about something, hey, look, this, you know, this is what the Bible says. But, but, you don't, you, you, you have to have the right spirit. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this church. We thank you for all the people that are gathered here together. Um, I trust that you're going to do great things here, that, that you'll move through. The that you would please help us to grow, help us to reach your Lord, help us to reach lost souls, that they could hear the gospel and get saved and end up getting just. Um, you in unity of spirit and humility of mind. We love you, in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen.